Hello, my name is Alexander Solozhin. I'm an RA here at the Institute of European, Russian and Eurasian Studies at Carleton University. For our War Observatory project, we're conducting a series of interviews with experts in various academic fields relevant to the war in Ukraine. In this series, we cover basic and advanced subject matters relevant to the war. We intend for these videos to be used as teaching materials for faculty and students in Canada and around the world. Joining me here today to answer a few questions regarding the war in Ukraine is Dr. Balkan Devlin. Balkan Devlin is the director of the Center in Modern Turkish Studies, MTS, at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University, a senior fellow at the McDonnell Laurier Institute, and a super forecaster for Good Judgment Incorporated. His research, his current research is focused on geopolitics from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, especially the foreign and security policies of Russia and Turkey, and best tools for dealing with uncertainty and making better decisions when stakes are high from probabilistic forecasting and war, war gaming to strategic foresight and scenarios. So to start with the basic questions, what what is the uh, current state um, of the war on the ground? Uh, so as of today, uh, thank you, thank you very much, Alex. Um, the war, uh, as as of as of um, today, continues to focus on on the fronts in the in the east and particularly in the south um, uh, of Ukraine. Just to backtrack uh, very quickly, the initial with the Russia's initial invasion. Uh, in 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 February twenty fourth, uh, Russians attacked in in three axes. Uh, it's go through one going aiming for Kiev um, to capture uh, the capital, another one uh, going uh, through Donbass, and then one also going through Kharkiv um, on on the east. So uh, north, uh, center, and 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 the uh, and the south um, was the direction uh, of of attack. The first phase of the war um, that attempt to uh, sort of a blitzkrieg to uh, Kiev failed and uh, which followed Russia uh, to consolidate uh, their uh, uh, war aims, their immediate uh, short-term war aims to capturing all of uh, Donbass and making gains in in the south, in uh, in and around uh, Kherson and Zaporizhia. So basically trying to uh, limit the front that they are um, they are they are targeting and focus their forces uh, on those on those two fronts. Now it's important to understand and remember that um, Ukraine is the second largest uh, country in Europe. It's a big country, and even this reduced front uh, is about eight hundred kilometers um, uh, when you when you look at it. Uh, all the way uh, from uh, you know, from Donbass and, and down down to the south. So it is still a quite a large uh, front uh, in which the, this this particular war is is going on. Um, I don't want to get into sort of the details of of the tactical um, aspects of it because they do change from time to time. But um, as 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 of this this particular recording on um, uh, August twelfth, uh, the focus the russian attack um focus seem to shift from um uh the operations in donbass um in the east towards the south uh particularly uh trying to uh, uh, maintain and, and strengthen their positions in Kherson uh, and, and and the surroundings in an anticipation for a, a, a ukrainian counter offensive uh, before uh, before winter, so uh, the war uh, turned into the uh, there are basically two couple phases to the war. But the initial war was this attempt uh, with um, uh, sort of a blitzkrieg attempt to to capture um, Kiev and uh, and establish a puppet uh, regime that serves uh, uh, Kremlin's interests. Uh, once that failed, the current stage of the war right now is very heavily dependent on uh, on artillery. Uh, and a missile strike. So it turned into a, a, almost a war of attrition on, on both sides. And um, as uh, you know, well-known Russia uh, military expert uh, Michael Kaufman recently said, the best way to describe the current state of affairs, both from the Russian side uh, as well as the Ukrainian side, is that it, it became an incremental 
war. The gains or the losses are incremental in the sense that we do not see at this stage massive uh, territorial gains or massive defeats on, on either side, but very heavy reliance on, on artillery, um, artillery fire, uh, which, um, you know, makes it on the map, not much movement, but extremely high levels of attrition, both in terms of personnel uh, as well as, as material. So um, in, a, in, in a sense, the war is perhaps more intense um, uh, with regards to the losses, um, uh, particularly uh, for the Ukrainian side, who have to ration their uh, you know, ammunition more than than Russia, um, but it is is particularly intense in terms of losses uh, when it comes to uh, both sides compared to uh, the the first uh, first phase of the war. So it is settling down in a way um, to a, a war of attrition in which each side, uh, particularly uh, Russia, try to grind down the Ukrainian uh, armed forces, and this is the you know trying to disassociate um, the Western support um, to Ukraine by increasing the attrition, both personnel and, uh, and, and material in the region and try to force uh, Ukraine um, uh, to, to either withdraw or, or come to an agreement at this stage. Um, unlike, um, you know, so it's not a big maneuver warfare where you have you know hundreds of thousands of troops moving around to capture cities etc but it is very much relying on on bombing both artillery as well as missiles and and, and, and air force bombing the the opposing uh forces um to uh degrade their ability to continue uh fighting um so it is in that sense a very bloody stage of of the war um, where we are, and um, you know, Russians uh, try to push their offensive uh, before before the fall comes, and 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 there's uh, both you know climate, the change in weather, but as well as their uh, existing capabilities and resources are exhausted. They try to push for more, um, and and Ukraine is uh, Ukrainian armed forces trying to push back the invaders um, uh, as much uh, as possible, and perhaps uh, gearing towards a counteroffensive. Um, targeting uh, particularly Kherson. Um, so that's where we are uh, today. It is a war of attrition at this stage uh, for, uh, for, for um, uh, and, and the Russians are, for that matter, digging in and getting ready to, to defend the territorial, um, uh, you know, the, the places they occupy uh, and invaded um, uh, before, before winter comes. And what has Turkey's role been in this war so far? So Turkey um, tried to and continues to try to walk a, a tight rope um, uh, in, in this particular war. Um, and maybe sort of a useful sort of backtrack is how Turkey's policy uh, sort of evolved um, from the first invasion back in 2014 uh, with, the, uh, with the illegal annexation uh, of Crimea and occupation of Crimea. Um, and and the and the establishment of those puppet regimes uh, in 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 Donbas, um, uh, Turkey never recognized uh, the annexation of Crimea um, uh, after two thousand fourteen, um, and continued to work closely uh, with Ukraine, particularly when it comes to defense um, and security cooperation, uh, including the joint production uh, of um, of weapon systems and and you know selling also uh, advanced weapon systems such as the Bayraktar drones. Um, but politically also, um, Turkey never recognized it, uh, highlight the, uh, the plight of Crimean Tatars because of you know, historical, linguistic, and, and cultural ties that Turkey have uh, with the Crimean Tatars. Um, so it was an important part of that, that, you know, that argument. But at the same time, uh, since from 2014, Turkey did not join the uh, sanctions against Russia. Uh, so economic sanctions were not part of uh, Turkey's uh, policy tool uh, when it's dealing with Russia. And it continued to work with uh, with Russia on other um, other domains, primarily uh, in with regards to Syria, um, as well as Libya, but also in, in, in the Caucasus, um, despite the fact that the, both countries tend to be on the opposing side. Uh, of these conflicts in Syria, for example, Russia has been uh, on the side of the Assad regime. Uh, Turkey is on the on the on the other side. Same goes for Libya, 
you know, Turkey and Russia are on, on opposing sides, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, despite you know uh, condemning uh, Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea and um, and continuing military cooperation uh, with Ukraine, um, Turkey also maintained a, a, a modus vivendi, a working relationship with Russia, tried to compartmentalize its its differences and did not join the sanctions regime. Furthermore. Uh, Turkey also both um, S-400 air defense um, systems um, uh, from Russia in 2017, 2018 uh, as well. So um, what Turkey tried to do, and that sort of structure didn't really change since from 2014 uh, till till today, trying to um, maintain relations both uh, both sides um, of uh, 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 of the conflict. Now. Uh, for uh, for for those who who are not uh, you know particularly aware, uh, Turkey is of course a, a NATO member and um, one of the three NATO member um, states in, in the Black Sea littoral that are that has has, has a cost to to the Black Sea. The other two being uh, Romania and and Bulgaria, um, but also Turkey is is the custodian and, and, and of the Turkish uh, Straits um, that controls um, access to Black Sea. Uh, from uh, from the Mediterranean, um, and, and Turkish policy have always been for a long while, for decades, um, based on uh, contr- you know, making sure that Turkey is the dominant actor, uh, you know, and and in necessarily in cooperation sometimes, but occasionally in conflict with Russia, with regards to the Black Sea, and wants to limit the outside influences um, uh, in in the region. So that the current um, Turkish policy when it comes to the renewal of the invasion uh, after February twenty fourth uh, of this year uh, continued that that line. Turkey, uh, you know, condemned uh, the invasion but did not uh, again join the sanctions. Um, Turkey did not uh, close its airspace uh, to Russian aircraft, uh, for example, um, and uh, not neither uh, you know ban oligarchs or or you know, financial transactions, etc. So Turkey continue to work both on the economic field um, and, and politically with Russia. At the same time, Turkish uh, you know, arms manufacturers, most famously the Bayraktar drones, uh, uh, the Baikar uh, who produces those armed uh, drones, um, uh, continue to provide uh, and work with Ukraine. Um, uh, recently announced uh, a, a joint uh, you know, production facility within Ukraine. And continue to provide, you know, in a sense, political support um, to uh, Ukraine at the same time. However, um, uh, the, one of the primary, of course, uh, drivers uh, for this balancing act that Turkey tries to pull off um, is, in, you know, significant reliance on on the, on the part of Turkey um, for the um, for Russian energy, uh, it's much like Europe. Um, Turkey is heavily dependent on um, Russian natural gas. Uh, I don't have the latest numbers on my fingers, but it is close to 50%. It uh, might be actually higher. Um, and furthermore, um, Turkey actually signed up with uh, Russia to you know, have to build it, to, to its first uh, nuclear power plant uh, in Akkuyu, in, uh, on, on the shores of Mediterranean. Again, it is a, a, a Russian project. So that actually increases... Turkey's um, reliance on on Russian energy, and um, which which is perhaps not the best uh, foreign policy decision. Um, so there is the economic and energy dependence that that Turkey has uh, with regards to Russia, as well as the need to uh, uh, have a working relationship in other theaters in which these countries have uh, interest uh, in Libya, in Syria. In the Caucasus, when it comes to uh, Nagano Karabakh, etc. So, um, and that need is trying to be balanced by um, Turkey's ongoing um, strategic relationship with Ukraine, as well as as a as a NATO member, the uh, the very clear and present danger that Russia poses to the alliance, and in which this this reinvasion of Ukraine very clearly. Um, uh, suggested and in, in in the summit in the Madrid, um, NATO um, uh, of course uh, NATO countries agreed that uh, Russia poses a clear and imminent um, uh, threat uh, to the allies. So um, that puts Turkey in a sort of an awkward position 
uh, this balancing act, this tightrope walking, uh, puts Turkey in, a, in sort of an awkward position in which it is uh, part of a, a, an alliance that very clearly identifies the Russian Federation as the primary threat, uh, and rightly so, as Russia's uh, you know brutal war in Ukraine um, uh, clearly demonstrates. But on the other hand, um, it is perhaps with with, with Hungary uh, as a sort of second uh, country within with NATO continues to maintain. Um, uh, political and economic relationships uh, with Russia and did not join this broader Western sanctions um, against uh, against the country. So it's a very tight rope that try to try to, 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 to walk. And uh, and and the President Erdogan of of, of Turkey um, uh, tried to play um, a, a mediating role um, uh, with regards to the conflict. And and and, and we'll, we'll perhaps talk a little bit more later on. Um, and sees its, its his role and con- you know country's role as a way to um, uh, to bridge that particular gap and position Turkey as a country that can talk to both sides uh, uh, in in this in this war.